Welcome, everybody. This is the Life Enthusiast Online Radio and TV Network, restoring vitality to you and to the planet. I'm your co-host, Scott Patton, and joining us, as usual, is Life Enthusiast Health Coach Martin Patella. Hey, Martin, how are you doing today? Good day, Scott. Happy to be here. Still kicking. <laughs> All right. Cool. Well, I'm very, very excited about today's show because we have a very special guest. He's called the Liver medic and he's an expert molecular biologist and he offers a holistic health approach to common diseases with helpful tick tips not ticks tips on nutrition that often go unnoticed and can be quite surprising uh, he conducts liver uh, lectures on nutrition and the liver all across north america and his ex health experience goes beyond this as well i was very interested to find out that he spent nearly 20 years in healthcare. And he formulated hundreds of products and worked for major pharmaceutical and medical device companies, in addition to running nutraceutical companies, which are uh, very high-end uh, supplements. And so we're uh, very excited to bring to the show Brendan Garan. How are you doing, Brendan? Hi, uh, very good. Thank you very much for having me on. I appreciate it. Cool. So um, I guess the my background actually is. I spent 20 years running grocery stores, and you spent 20 years in healthcare. So I kind of think I was responsible for all the business that the healthcare uh, companies and departments and governments all got because I was selling Coca Cola and uh, Cheerios and white bread and all those processed GMO foods like crazy. Uh, so we're now, you know, we were kind of on the opposite side. You were trying to fix all the catastrophes that I was causing. And I really want to take this time, opportunity to apologize to you. I didn't know any better. <laughs> <laughs> uh, understood, accepted, not your fault. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I hate to tell you, but all of my peers and the people that came after are continuing to do their best to keep the healthcare system overloaded with work. Yeah, and I think that's uh, the primary mission uh, that we have in terms of education is how do we get uh, folks to identify foods that are doing damage, causing inflammation and causing disease, get them away from those things and start doing some uh, healthy, you know, incorporating some healthy habits, uh, and which is a real challenge because of course, as you know, you know, over the last 30 or 40 years, there's been um, this confluence of uh, chemical companies along with uh, Agra and in um, the grocery, uh, that is uh, unfortunately promoting a lot of this stuff. So I always tell folks, you know, stay uh, stay at the peripheries. Uh, don't go inside aisles on grocery stores. Go to the uh, the produce and that that kind of stuff. But as you mentioned before, because of the GMOs, you got to be that much more careful, even in the produce section. So, but we'll we'll talk about all of those things. And I'm sure your audience is well versed in a lot of these things as well. Oh, I don't know. I think we should try and tell it again and again and again because. It took me probably 15 years from knowing that I was in trouble to actually committing all in realizing that there's just no halfway. I couldn't be just a little bit careful. I had to be just vigilant. Yeah. Yeah. And it's funny that we bring this uh, topic up because, um, you know, I just moved down to uh, Florida from uh, Connecticut. And they're uh, spraying glyphosate directly into um, the, the estuary behind me as turtles and, and birds and all that stuff. And uh, so I, I called up the wildlife um, uh, water and wildlife uh, department here in Florida. And they said, well, glyphosate is perfectly fine. It's perfectly fine for the animals. It's perfect. Just as it's perfectly fine for human consumption. And, you know, when we take a look at that stuff, and of course, we're going to go into what to eat, what not to eat, where these things are coming uh, from when we start talking about toxins and how do we get rid of them and the damage it does to the gut and therefore also the liver uh, and other subsequent things that we call um, or we refer to as metabolic syndrome. But yeah, glyphosate is not safe. Uh, it's specifically designed to go after um, uh, certain bacteria. Uh, and a lot of times those same metabolic pathways uh, are present in the friendly bacteria within our gut, which ends up destroying that. Uh, it's uh, been identified as uh, glyphosate has been identified as a uh, compound that um, riddles the small intestine with um, 
holes in it and then travels to the liver and inhibits a whole host of cytochromes uh, referred to as P450 cytochromes. And so uh, not only does it increase the amount of toxins in your body, but it reduces your own ability to remove them. And we can get into the epigenetics of this too. Uh, for folks out there who have never heard of the MTHFR gene mutation, there have been a, uh, a lot of science done recently indicating that the Roundup chemicals, including glyphosate, uh, negatively impact the MTHFR gene, making it more prevalent in folks. And that also further reduces people's ability to remove toxins. So not to get real deep into this real quickly, but we'll, we'll talk about all of those topics. Well, let's, let's mention the statistics. The MTHFR mutation, you're either uh, homozygous or heterozygous. Right. And that means you either have one parent or two parents with that mutation. So you can be a zero, one, or two. Right. And uh, do, do you have the population statistics, the numbers of how many people in America are actually carriers? So it, uh, it differs by ethnic group. Um, about 10 years or so ago, uh, scientists used to believe that the uh, MTHFR gene mutation really only affected about 2 to 3% of the population. Um, now, uh, there's a little bit uh, more controversy about what the actual figures are, but they are reasonably sure that that 2 to 3% is 100% uh, affected or occluded. Uh, the uh, Hispanic population, for some reason, is higher uh, with the MTHFR gene mutation. And this is where we get into some controversy that uh, they've indicated can be anywhere between, say, 25 to, to 30 to maybe even 40 percent. Uh, and with other ethnic groups, it's a little bit lower. But we're looking at somewhere of an average of uh, anywhere between, say, eight to about 20 percent. Uh, again, these these um, percentages seem to be all over the place uh, because it's highly underdiagnosed. You have to go and get tested for this. It's not a particularly involved test, although you should uh, I, I should put a caveat on this. Uh, sometimes insurance companies will identify you as a higher risk group, so your insurance could go up. So something to obviously consider. <laughs> But um, don't, you know, ask, don't tell. Right, right, exactly. So, uh, for uh, for example, my wife uh, is a carrier for the MTHFR gene mutation. So she obviously takes the methyl B12 and takes a couple of other uh, supplements to make sure that her, her liver is operating properly and uh, able to um, degrade and remove uh, hormones properly. Uh, able to take uh, fat soluble toxins to water soluble. Uh, break down other components, you know, just basic function uh, of the liver. And I think that a lot of people, probably this could be the first time they've even heard of the MTHFR uh, gene mutation. So people ought to go, uh, after this uh, talk, ought to go out there and start Googling it because it's really important and it really negatively affects all of the things that we're going to be talking about. Detoxification, sleep, chronic inflammation, um, you know, uh, hormone regulation. So, and that's everything. So yeah. it's important. In, in my world, I have the Ashkenazi Jewish uh, genes in me. And surprisingly or unsurprisingly, they have been highly inbred in Eastern Europe. Yeah. And they, they really amplified this. And it's quite prevalent. What was interesting for me to find out, I did the 23andMe panel. <clears throat> so I have the big picture. So I wasn't high on the MTHFR itself, but several surrounding supporting mutations are there. So I still have the same effects of the undermethylation capacity or not ability to methylate well. The fun right. part was you get linguistics talents, you get musical talents, you get high achiever personality, and, and you don't have a whole lot of energy and you have to really conserve and you have to be careful how much you take on and so on, blah, blah, blah. It's quite an interesting thing. Just like everything, everything is, has, has its sunny side and shadow side, you know, there are the good things and Indeed. the bad things. This, this can very easily turn into a spiritual conversation, but yes, yeah, makes sense. Makes perfect sense. Yeah. Anyway, thanks. And so the liver. Right. So let's, I suppose we want to, I know that a lot of listeners, certainly uh, you, you guys know uh, this backwards and forwards, but let's uh, hit the pathology, right? So uh, we're talking about the standard American diet or the SAD diet. 
changes the microbiome in the digestive tract and how does it do that. Um, over the last, I'd say probably 20 or so years, we've had um, an increase uh, in the amount of antibiotics getting into people's systems. And when I uh, do this lecture for physicians, they always raise their hands and profusely say, look, that, that's not true. Uh, show us the facts. And I say, look, it is not coming from doctors. Uh, the scripts on antibiotics from physicians is actually going down about 5% uh, during that same time period. However, what's happening is there's a consolidation uh, within our food industry, cattle, uh, pigs, uh, poultry, etc. So when a consolidation takes place, you have a lot more animals on a lot less land, and they are typically, unfortunately, um, sitting in their own um, excrement. Excrement, exactly. So that's going to heighten disease. That's going to heighten bacteria count. That's going to heighten uh, problems. So I mean, you can't have an animal that's diseased and then go to slaughter. So they pump them full of antibiotics, and that's getting into the food stream, and that's getting into your bodies. So when the antibiotics end up getting into the system, of course, that uh, totally changes that uh, friendly bacterial uh, community that you have down there. And then you have the opportunistic guys end up moving in. So this can be uh, homegrown uh, bacteria. Um, this can be C. diff. This can be H. pylori. This can be a whole host of, of things that you naturally find in your system and need. But when they're in an overgrowth or a dysbiosis, um, they create all kinds of problems. I mean, H. pylori has been identified as creating ulcers. So that's just one uh, of the, uh, the side effects. C. diff, very difficult to control once it gets into an overgrowth. And typically, you need antibiotics to get that back into control. Um, but another thing that's uh, very um, opportunistic is candida. And most folks, uh, because of the increases in sugar and carbohydrate consumption, are walking around with uh, candida overgrowth. Um, and I think that if we were to go after that primarily um, and get that under control, that would probably solve a lot of the leaky gut issue. So you're, you're throwing some science at it or names of creatures. But what's interesting is what happens, like this C. diff, as in Clostridium difficile, it's associated with autism and ADD and all of that. So, you know, you may hear C. diff and think, oh, what the heck? Well, what it means is that when you have an overgrowth of that, it's, it's poop. It's byproducts are pushing out into your gut toxins that are going to cause you to be uh, mentally changed into the autistic spectrum. Absolutely. So it's not a small deal. No, it's not. And thank you for uh, sort of uh, giving That's that right. insight to the listeners. That's very important. Uh, you know, it's funny. So about, I'd say, 10 or so years ago when I was going to these naturopathic, osteopathic conferences, I'd say maybe 5% of their lectures were dedicated uh, or, or focused on leaky gut and the causes of it and SIBO and all of these things, uh, which folks should, should go out there and Google. Uh, now it's completely inverted. So when they start talking about cognitive declines, uh, ADHD, uh, brain fog, um, uh, arthritis, um, cardiovascular issues, all kinds of uh, different diseases, it always starts with leaky gut. Okay, so we have the breakdown of the microbiome, we have leaky gut, and here are the classifications of either bacteria or uh, microtoxins or mycotoxins that are getting into the system, and this is the problem that it's creating. It's creating inflammation, uh, which either uh, stirs up an autoimmune uh, response that gives way to all of these problems. So you're absolutely right. It's important that people understand the connection. Right. So, for instance, thyroid health or thyroid decline could be very easily tied to the microbial health, for example, which yeah. then will translate into inability to lose weight, which then will translate into polycystic ovarian syndrome or, or inability to get pregnant or inability to finish carrying the pregnancy to term or giving birth to babies that are less than perfect. And yeah, on absolutely. and on. Yeah, um, boy, I feel like I'm. I feel like I'm back in a in a uh, physician's lecture. But yeah, absolutely. So let's let's go into that pathology so people kind of understand what's going on there. So uh, let's just move forward with uh, the diet, change the microbiome. You have leaky gut. Okay, so now you have leaky gut. So what does that mean? That means you have uh, typically an overgrowth of candida. Candida releasing aldehydes that ends up breaking down the small tissue. That means uh, so. 
the skin of your gut is just like the skin uh, you know, on your arm. It's made up of epithelial cells and the cells are connected by anchors and the aldehydes being released by candida. This is the, one of the uh, negative side effects of having uh, candida overgrowth. Start to break down the connective tissue between uh, epithelial cells and open up J channels. And that's one of the ways in which uh, you end up getting uh, leaky gut. Um, let's just go uh, beyond that because I don't want to get stuck necessarily in uh, all the, the biochemistry of leaky gut, although it's very important. When you start to um, experience a inflow of toxins, past uh, the gut lining from the lumen of the digestive tract into the body, then the immune system flares up. It recognizes all these foreign invaders. Well, what's it going to do? So uh, it gets into a heightened uh, state and it stays that way until you solve the leaky gut issue. Most people are completely unaware that it's going on. So it goes on for an extended period of time. And your body essentially is making the determination that we cannot be in a chronically inflamed state forever because it is an artificially aging process and we're going to do something about it. So what does it do? It starts to send a signal to the adrenal glands to start secreting cortisol. Cortisol decreases the inflammatory response. The problem is, is that signal never stops. You end up with adrenal fatigue. Okay. So that's where typically uh, where people get adrenal fatigue most often, not always. Uh, the the side effects of that is you're reducing the inflammatory response so the toxins are flowing into the body and, not, and, and now they're completely overwhelming the immune system. They're flowing into the liver, which we'll get to in a second. But the uh, immune system also recognizes the thyroid. Um, so it, it gets uh, sort of crisscrossed. The epithelial cells look a little bit like uh, thyroid tissue. And they can't quite determine where this uh, influx from the invaders are coming from. So a lot of times you'll have the immune system directly um, attacking thyroid tissue, which can, I know this may not always make sense, can uh, put you into a hyper, uh, make you um, uh, either give you a hy hypothyroidism or hyperthyroidism. Uh, and then uh, cortisol also decreases TSH, which is thyroid stimulating hormone. So with decreased stimulating hormone, you're going to have decreased activity. When the thyroid is decreased, uh, especially in both of these actions, you're going to decrease your metabolism. So to your point, that's the weight gain piece. Not only that, so here's, here's, here's the other effect of this, is when you have a slower metabolism, that's going to slow down um, the workings of your digestive tract and things end up uh, in a more severe overgrowth. So that's when a lot of people experience even more dysbiosis, more small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. So it, it, yeah, it is a it's a positive feedback loop in a very negative manner. So <laughs> people have to be aware of this stuff. And you know, if it goes on too long, Certainly, you'll end up with fatty liver, and, and uh, I'll discuss that piece of it. But also, um, one of the other things is people will experience pain, um, discomfort in their digestive tract, which they'll typically see as uh, IBS. And a physician will say, what are the other symptoms? And people say, well, I have um, acid reflux and heartburn. Well, I got a pill for that. So um, what ends up happening is they'll end up taking the purple pill Nexium, which is typical. That will bring the stomach acid more to a neutral uh, position, which uh, keeps the esoph esophageal uh, sphincter, which separates the stomach and the esophagus from engaging because it needs very acidic uh, stomach acid in order to engage. So you continuously have that liquid going up. It's just not as acidic, so you don't feel it as much. But it allows an environment where you can have the, uh, the bacteria that are growing in the intestinal tract that are causing all the problems to then move into the stomach. And that is a, a pretty severe problem. Right. Yes. So the solution actually leads, leads to complication. The purple pill is essentially as a upside down solution to something because yeah. the, the solution should have been to increase acidity or at least the digestive power with something like betaine or hydrochloric acid or both and digestive enzymes to just get the food from the stomach burned through faster as opposed to not. 
Yeah, absolutely. And, and there's many natural alternatives and many natural ways in which you can do this. I mean, you first, uh, probably a good idea to go after the candida and, uh, candida and other uh, parasites, uh, apple cider vinegar, uh, oregano, caprylic acid, uh, wormwood, uh, black walnut holes, that, all that kind of stuff, all those natural herbs. Um, serapeptase is also a pretty good enzyme to go after the biofilm that accumulates in the small intestine. Um, you know, so there are uh, multiple ways in which you can go after that. Uh, and I'm sure you have, uh, some other, uh, solutions that, that people should probably be paying attention to as well and can incorporate into a regimen. Indeed. Yeah. We have these all in one powders that you can add in that will solve the, uh, either the uh, stomach issue or the small intestine issue or the large intestine issue. And what's interesting, and you know this, is that the pH in the digestive tract flips back and forth, back and forth. In the mouth, it's uh, alkaline. In the stomach, it's acidic. In the small intestine, it's alkaline. Again, in large intestine, it flips to acidic. And if you don't have these swings, things don't happen as they should. And because yeah. of these pH balances, different creatures live in different segments and you you just suggested it right like so if you're supposed to be living in the alkaline you should not translate or transfer into the acidic and and you just illustrated how this happens exactly and we can talk about you know i know we're going to be talking about uh, obviously liver health uh without a doubt uh, and sleep and so you know, let's we can follow this pathology progression a little bit uh, into some of those other corridors of the body. So, um, when let's we illustrate more and what actually happens to a person, so that they understand. You know, like I could babble about pH balances all day long, but what it means is that if your stomach pH is off, you're going to bloat and burp. If yes. your uh, if your um, small intestine pH is off, you're going to swell. You're going to have a protruding belly. And you're going to possibly get as far in as uh, Crohn's disease. And yeah, anyway. and we also, yeah, no, th those are really important points. Uh, we oftentimes see individuals with back pain too. And it's not as a result of, um, you know, helping somebody move three years ago. I mean, obviously that probably didn't help. But to your point, if, uh, if you're experiencing bloat uh, forward, well, you're spinal column is keeping that, that uh, bloat from going out the other way but that doesn't mean that it's not pushing on something right yeah. <laughs> could be pushing on a nerve um, and that causes problems so you know let's take a look at so when we talked about uh you know eating too much sugars and carbohydrates you know let's just get a picture of what that thing looks like but so about 100 years or so ago folks were ingesting about 11 to 12 pounds of sugar annually now we're talking about uh close to 130 pounds Per person annually. So that is obviously going to completely change the microbiome in your digestive tract. And the studies show that uh, the candida end up communicating through your vagus nerve. So individuals out there who think to themselves, well, I, you know, I don't want to give up my chocolate. I don't want to give up, uh, you know, the pastry. I don't want to give up X, Y, and Z or my Coca-Cola or whatever. Um, think real uh, hard about what exactly is asking for those things. It uh, quite possibly is the candida and the studies show that if you uh, remove, not remove the candida, but if you get it back into a balanced position, your cravings for sugar and carbohydrates go way down. So clearly it's had an impact. So what you're saying is uh, the tail is wagging the dog. We've gotten into this situation where all this bacteria, like we think we're thinking and we're making all these decisions and everything else. And the fact is, is these itty bitty little unwanted uh, or excessive microbes or little critters are running around in our stomachs and they're going, hey, man, I'm out of sugar. Like, And then it goes up into our brain and we've got this craving for sugar, which we think is our craving, but it's really the let's say the bad guys in this situation's craving that's controlling us. Yeah, it's a perfect description. And I think that sort of has a tendency to freak people out once in a while because they look at nature and they say, well, you know, they'll uh, turn on the channel and they'll see some parasite has taken over a wasp or a spider or something. Well, thank goodness that does not take place in humans. No, it takes place in humans. <laughs> so. this, is the, this is the ultimate fantasy. Ridley Scott, alien. 
Right, 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 exactly. But it you know, it doesn't come out of our stomach. It just, it just stays inside the whole time. Yeah, exactly. Hidden from view, right? But to your point, you know, uh, I like to tell people that we are bacteria buses. You know, we are ten to one bacteria to cells, and that is a very complex community. Uh, they break down uh, macronutrients. They communicate to us what's uh, in our bodies. Uh, they help defend uh, against um, invaders, which is one of the reasons why I'm not a huge proponent of antibacterial soaps, well, antibiotics in general. Um, you know, you are getting rid of a massive community along with these um, potentially negative bugs uh, that's going to prevent the next uh, infection. So be very wary about doing those things. Yeah, we are very strong in uh, promoting dirt. We promote it in the form of humic acid, fulvic acid, and soil-based organisms, telling people you need to wash less and eat more dirt. Absolutely, yeah. I'm, I'm a huge proponent of that. I'll get behind you 110% on that. Absolutely. So you've been painting this very depressing picture, which is basically telling everybody, if you continue doing what you're doing, like you really like that Coca-Cola, but you know what, when you're 10 years older than now and your stomach is just totally leaky gut, like stuff just goes right through and into your bloodstream that shouldn't, and you're in pain and you're in agony and you're asking your doctor for drugs to help deal with the pain or to help deal with whatever the symptoms are that you're sh that they're showing, uh, you, I guess what I'm saying is, is you can paint, you know, you can short term gain for long term pain or short term pain for long term gain is the decision that everybody really has to make. And having sort of said that, you know, okay, you know, what's the other side of it? Okay, I understand my Coca Cola is not helping my stomach and, it's, and, and I'm starting to see I'm hitting maybe 30 or 35 and all of a sudden I'm not running as fast as I could and I'm not. I'm putting on weight. I can't get it off as well the way I could. Like I'm getting older, but it's not that I'm getting older. It's the fact that I am so out of balance that my youth is no longer compensating for it. So what do I do? Yeah. Yeah. That's the most common question. <laughs> yep. You painted a terrible picture. Okay. How do we solve this? So, um, and it, it will depend on uh, the individual, obviously. Um, as I tell people, the aging process doesn't necessarily mean aging and decrepitly declining. You know, the standard of living doesn't necessarily need to decline along with um, advanced age. So um, one of the things that I encourage folks to do on a regular basis is uh, incorporate superfoods into their diet. Um, remove the uh, rancid oils. That's a major component. So we're talking about the vegetable oils and the highly processed oils and incorporating coconut uh, oil and red palm and olive and, and uh, you know, butter uh, from a from a healthy animal and non-GMO consuming animal, obviously. Uh, apple cider vinegar on a regular basis. Um, you know, I do a protein shake in the morning with superfoods. I make sure that I have uh, plenty of fiber in there as well and, and omegas. So I get that from flaxseed and chia seed. You know, those are the things that people ought to be doing on a more regular basis. Um, eating or consuming oligo uh, fructosaccharides, uh, that's a really important thing. Uh, okay, wait, what, what is that? So Prebiotics. Prebiotics, the, exactly. the food of the bugs. Right. That's what that's what the beneficial bacteria end up uh, consuming to make sure that they end up staying alive. And let me um, transition for just a quick second. One of the things that's a very easy um, uh, sort of a thing to put into the diet, a regimen to put in the diet, is drink lemon water in the morning. So this is uh, you know twenty ounces of of water with a little bit of lemon in there. Okay, obviously it has to be organic. So uh, what are we referring to there? Polyphenols. So polyphenols have a tendency to send a signal to the liver to drop bile um, from the liver into the gallbladder, clean that out, and into the small intestine, which feed these beneficial bacteria as well. So um, the prebiotics are very important. Uh, bile, of course, is very important. Um, what are some of the other things that I can uh, I tell folks about? Um, cleaning your system on a regular basis. So uh, I typically tell people, uh, and I know you're shaking your head. You probably oh, have. Yeah, I'm shaking my head. Yes. But what I'm trying to say here is 
we talked about the gut plenty, which is the, it's sort of like the uh, um, anti, anti room, whatever we call it, the, the foyer of the liver, right? Yes. If, if the um, liver was the living room, the gut is the hallway that leads to it. Absolutely. And so we kind of got stuck in the gut. We described that the hallway is full of mud and whatever, but we haven't gotten to the point what happens when this mud gets tracked into the living room. We need to get into the liver. All right. So let's tell them what happens. And then we tell them, you tell them what they need to do to undo the mess. Because the problem is that never mind that your gut's in trouble. Yes, you have to fix it. But you'll know that the gut's in trouble because your liver is now in trouble as a consequence of that. Yeah, great point. So let's uh, so let's talk about that in a little bit more detail. Thank you for that. So uh, these toxins are flowing into the body. Um, they overwhelm the uh, immune system, and they get uh, filtered by uh, the liver. Seventy percent of blood flow goes directly to the liver. So the liver essentially um, uh, will do this in a in a uh, uh, sort of an easy to understand format. So when these toxins end up coming into the liver, the liver takes a look at these things and it says, okay, um, this compound has uh, an amino group on it. It's got a vitamin. I can start pulling things off and leave whatever is left behind this toxic. I don't know what this is for uh, another phase within the liver. So the first phase is called subtraction. It's called phase one. And it removes the chopping. Exactly. Chopping. It cleaves things. Exactly. So we can use some of the components that end up coming in that are recognized by the body. All the other things are toxic to the body, fat soluble, okay, cannot be washed out of the body. And those things must be identified by the liver and transition to phase two, where the detoxification of those things uh, occur. And that's very simple. You take it from a fat soluble state to a water soluble state so you can wash it out of the body. Makes sense, right? So uh, the problem is, is when you have leaky gut and this influx of toxins, you and phase one and phase two don't talk to each other. They're completely decoupled. So phase one can go all day long, 24 hours a day, having a great time, no problem, creating all of these toxins and the liver can't catch up. Phase two can't catch up. Okay, so as a last sort of ditch defense, the liver ends up creating a fat cell in order to store the toxin these fat cells build up. They start to, if they uh, get to a high enough concentration, block uh, blood flow into uh, critical components within the uh, liver, like hepatic cells, for instance, and so forth. Um, and the toxins themselves also do damage to cell membranes and mitochondria and, and other components within the liver. So that is a sort of textbook fatty liver uh, problem and if it continues beyond five to eight percent concentration within the liver, then you get into uh, places like NASH and fibrosis and cirrhosis and beyond that, you are looking for a new liver and that's a very bad uh, place to be. Um, your genes can sometimes determine how much of this fat is just within the liver or in other parts. So you can look at an individual; they could be skinny and they can have fatty liver disease, uh, or they could be obese. So you won't be able to tell by looking at them. So what do you do in this case? How do you reverse this process? Um, so, uh, you know, we have products for this, and I always encourage folks to uh, incorporate things like silymarin, or, um, which is uh, basically the active molecule within milk thistle. So milk thistle. Uh, I think that when people take a milk thistle product, um, they should always be taking a choline. Phosphatidylcholine is a good uh, source for that. Um, the choline enhances the effectiveness of psilocybin. So now we're talking about ingredients that specifically target and enhance phase two conjugation, that detoxification phase within the liver. Um, you're trying to uh, you're trying to replenish these critical components that make up that uh, multiple cycles within phase two. So glutathione, of course, is uh, important in that. Um, NAC is important with that. Uh, anything that's a sulfur donator or meth, uh, methionine donator, uh, MSM, SAMe, those are really important things to include in there. Um, you know, a lot of physicians uh, like putting berberine in there. Berberine does a couple of different things. It obviously enhances the phase two conjugation piece of it, uh, but also stimulates AMP kinase. 
Um, so we talked about these toxins, where do they reside? They reside in fat cells. Now you've sort of kicked up phase two conjugation. Now you have to get at these toxins. Well, in that case, you have to break down the fat in order to access them. So you want berberine in there to make sure that the AMP kinase is stimulated. So those are some of the things um, that... Yeah. Uh, so you're outlining it in a nice way as, you know, I always try to tell people about the good, better, and best. Mm -hmm. And uh, there are some basic things that, I mean, we unfortunately have people who have uh, all the resources available and other people who have very little that they can do because uh, of their financial situation. They're just stuck. Yeah. And unfortunately, the... Uh, American uh, tax regime, I know I should say Congress, has voted to support the uh, agriculture that creates the foods that are subsidized that are making the most health problems of the nation. So it's this vicious cycle of the foods that are the cheapest are the worst for you to eat because they create the most of this negative change. And so your your high starch fried, uh, which is peroxidated fat that you mentioned earlier, and so on is the is the worst. Anyway, so the baseline you mentioned the sulfur and methyl that's MSM that's cheap and affordable. Yeah, absolutely, silymarin is quite affordable. We actually sell some tea that's made with that, or there are multiple ways to get at it. But yeah, yes, absolutely. there's there's this wonderful product you guys formulated that has all of it in it, right? So yeah. there, there is this wonderful convenience of here is my bottle, hold it up, right? Just like that. And it's the I have the product that you can conveniently purchase and do all of this. But if you can't afford this X dollars a month, mm -hmm. then there still are basics you can do. Yeah, absolutely. And I, you know, back to the old axiom of uh, food be thy medicine and medicine be thy food, you know. Um, but when we were taking a look at this initially, you know, I had friends and family members who had fatty liver disease. So it was important for me to go out and try to help them. And when I was going to a health food store, my God, I was I was pulling back about 10, 10 or 12 different supplements. And so that's why we uh, put the um, hepatobin together. It's a compound. It's, you know, a pretty easy uh, to take and it's you know it's we're talking about one or two supplements as opposed to you know 10 or 12 um, right but um, you know to your point when we t when we start talking about fatty liver and some of the other things that uh, end up being associated with it um, you know Hashimoto's comes to mind uh, fibromyalgia adrenal fatigue um, you know, we talked about uh, the autoimmune problems. So that's that's the Hashimoto's and, and fibromyalgia. So you know, we have excess toxins in the system. Well, that's that's can certainly trigger fibromyalgia too. Um, the excess cortisol uh, as a response to the inflammation that's taking place uh, both within the liver and in the di digestive tract that's going to uh, end up interrupting sleep. So that's that serotonin uh, melatonin oh, yeah. connection. Uh, and a lot of times folks will think that they're going for a natural alternative uh, for sleep and pull the uh, melatonin off the shelf. Well, anything that you take outside the body uh, for melatonin will signal the body to stop secreting it internally. So you don't want to do that. Although I definitely am against the Lunesta and you know all that other uh, sleeping nonsense. So you really need to choose a product that gives you adrenal support, which are uh, the necessary uh, vitamins and minerals and adaptogenic herbs. Uh, magnesium is really important in that. Magnesium glycinate, I think, being probably the best form of that. So that will take care of a lot of those issues and will help uh, an individual with uh, managing stress during the day. You know, we're talking about, you know, when we go back to Chinese medicine, liver is the emotional seat of the soul. So if your emotions are sort of out of balance, you're going to have some difficulty handling stress during the day. So, you know, we're talking about B vitamins and magnesium, uh, it's selenium and uh, some of the other things. So all of those um, things are important. Um, we do have uh, sleep and uh, stress products, uh, which we call Zen Sleep and, and Zen Calm. Uh, and they have, uh, obviously, they're all organic. And those are our options for folks, um, you know, looking for alternatives to uh, Lunesta and Ambien and et cetera, et cetera. Um, so 
uh, when you have, I know you have a uh, following of uh, folks out there uh, who have fibromyalgia and I'm not going to go, I'm sure they probably know fibromyalgia even better than I do. But I will say that the buildup of toxins and this chronic inflammation issue um, can lead them down the road of going after uh, NSAIDs, non-steroidal uh, anti-inflammatory drugs to try and solve this problem, which unfortunately creates more of an issue in the digestive tract. And now your liver is further challenged by having to break those things down, uh, putting ad additional stresses on phase two conjugation. So we typically tell folks that, you know, they ought to be reaching for natural alternatives for uh, pain relief as well, which, um, you know, typically will do, uh, you know, a turmeric uh, with the high curcumin uh, and uh, ginger and, you know, some of those uh, sort of natural uh, things. If you want to add a couple to that, you go right ahead, please. Oh, no, it's great. Great. Actually, I'm finding that a lot of these people are prescribed opioids like tramadol, and uh, oh, so they're they're in they're getting all kinds of systems shut down as collateral damage. So instead of healing, they're just simply um, I, I don't know what the word is, just coasting with the engine shut off, hoping that they'll make the runway. Yeah, I agree. I mean, it's you are essentially looking at a small fire within your body and the way that you are treating it is by making a big fire somewhere else. Um, and that's a real serious concern. Of course, when you have uh, higher elevated uh, liver enzymes, you, ha you have damage in there, you have a chronic inflammation, um, you probably cannot manage, because the liver is a regulatory organ for blood uh, glucose cycles, uh, it sends a signal to the pancreas to secrete insulin. It breaks down insulin. So you probably have a lot more sugar uh, floating uh, in and around your circulatory system. Well, that's certainly going to create damage. So now you've got heightened rates of cholesterol. Well, they're going to reach for a statin drug, and they're going to give that to you, which is going to give you neural problems. You'll have cognitive decline fairly quickly. It doesn't solve, right, doesn't solve the uh, cholesterol problem. Uh, to your point, let me back up for a second. So when you take a statin drug, you're absolutely right, I, I, I digress. When you take a statin drug, you are essentially reducing the amount of usable fat within the system. Every cell in the body uses fat um, for its cellular membrane, and the entire endocrine system is extremely reliant on fat um, for uh, neural growth, uh, for a lot of different things, uh, and certainly for hormone um, uh, capacity. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, right. So you're decreasing your hormones, you're decreasing your ability uh, for neural um, connection. Uh, it's a big problem. And that's one of the things that's hardest to get people off of. NSAIDs are hard to get off of. Statin drugs are hard to get off of. So they don't um, usually work well uh, with other things. Well, uh, <laughs> the stuff that's really hard to get off of <laughs> are the psychoactive things like Lyrica and... Uh, uh, Scott, do you remember the other drugs that uh, people? I mean, I have. We have a list of all there these things. There was one that, that started with speak. Cam, Cam gabapentin, is gabapentin is the big one that I see. Absolutely, that was going to be the, my next point, and you you hit the nail right on the head. Once you're on those things, you have to very slowly wean yourself off and have something in the background that's natural to sort of supplement all of the um, sort of nutritional um, deficiencies that caused those problems. And you're right, for folks out there that are on those, uh, you, you typically need a physician to help you out. And it needs to be an, uh, an osteopathic, not an allopathic, not a conventional doc. They are not going to understand any of this. Not only that, but they'll laugh you out of the room. So just avoid that. Yeah, yeah you, need, you need a functional medicine practitioner who understands how the allopathic pharmaceutical drugs work and finds you a way or at least some guidance to get that out of your system. So oh, good luck, right? Yeah, it's, it's definitely a challenge, um, no doubt. And, um, you know, okay, I, let's, let's go back to the liver. So we have, okay. we have had you explain that we have the phase one, which is the essentially the pre-processing the phase two, which is the post-processing, and in phase one, uh, most people's phase one works fine. Mm -hmm. But phase two is when the impairments show up because all of a sudden we now have stuff for the liver to deal with in phase two that we are genetically unprepared for. 
we are designed for a life in a savanna. There's no glyphosate, no mercury, no uh, uh, rocket fuel or uh, uh, dry cleaning vapors and whatever. Like all of that stuff is there and we're totally not designed for it. Yeah, boy, uh, great point. And uh, you've, you've sort of triggered uh, me to discuss something on sort of a parallel route. But um, so you need to be, if you are in this state where you have fatty liver, uh, you need to be drinking a lot more water. You need to be taking these supplements that we're talking about. That's the only way that you're going to do it. There is no pharmaceutical equivalent. As soon as you uh, throw a drug into the system, you put uh, additional pressure on the liver to try and break that down. So the metformins of the world, I'm sorry, it's not going to help you. Um, but to your point, um, there are a lot of toxins out there. So, you know, when we give the lecture, um, we typically, we're talking about personal health care products. Uh, we're talking about endocrine disrupting uh, chemicals that are uh, on farmlands and, uh, you know, other, other sources. Plastics. We have, yeah. We have, uh, if you go to livermedic.com, we have, you know, articles on um, the sources of, of a lot of these things. Uh, but, you know, shampoos and toothpastes and uh, underarm deodorants and lotions and fragrances, you'd be surprised. They have, uh, you know, PEG, they have uh, uh, other uh, petroleum-based uh, ingredients in there, EDTA. I mean, these are things a lot of times are, are banned in other countries. Perfectly okay. It, no problem get the uh you know the stamp of approval by the fda here in the us and uh they are oftentimes endocrine disrupting um chemicals uh people don't realize that 75 percent of what you put on your skin is transdermal in other words it goes from your skin directly into your system so you are now challenged with how are you going to get this out and it is essentially the liver's job to do that and if you have your liver full of toxins it's simply not going to happen. So people need to get on a regimen, even if you don't uh, have fatty liver disease, if you haven't been diagnosed, you probably should be on a maintenance regimen on a regular basis and incorporating these supplements into your diet, just because the world is not a friendly place, <laughs> health-wise. Yeah. Well, and the other thing I wanted to add just to what you said, Brendan, was do you want to wait until you have a liver problem to deal with it? Or do you want to make sure that you don't have a liver problem to deal with? And as somebody who had a liver problem and ended up spending six weeks in the hospital not eating and losing 45 pounds, uh, let me tell you, it's a lot better to prevent it than to go through what you might have to go through to survive it. Yeah. And, you know, we just listed all of these other associated issues that um, that come along with it. You know, the, the candida overgrowth, uh, you know, will give you this the skin irritation problems. And uh, uh, that's typically where people end up starting out. And the IBS gives you the, the pain issues. Um, and, you know, then you have the fatty liver, which will probably inter interrupt your uh, blood glucose cycles. So uh, people starting to look for signs that they have them. Um, you know, certainly skin irritation, although that, that can be a lot of different things, uh, white tongue, that, that's certainly an indication, um, fasting, uh, blood glucose in the morning. If you're above a hundred, that's probably a, a good, uh, red flag that your liver is involved in, in probably in some uh, level of distress and you need to sort of start focusing on it. But anybody who has sleep issues, um, you probably need to be testing your cortisol level throughout the day just to make sure that that's not really an inflammatory issue. Uh, and yeah, it's stress and it, you know, you probably could benefit from a good magnesium source and, and uh, B vitamins. But what we are talking about are prophylactics. Um, people need to look at their health a lot more closely. So let's, this, this is a great segue to metabolic syndrome or syndrome X to mm -hmm. uh, time to describe it, right? Like there's, there's this fellow at two o'clock in the afternoon thinking that he's having a heart attack. Right. He's not having a heart attack. He's having a metabolic shutdown. Right. right. Yeah, exactly. So again, it's, uh, it's the leaky gut, chronic inflammation, fatty liver disease, adrenal fatigue. Um, you know, that ends up uh, resulting in a high elevated um, LDL, uh, the uh, bad uh, cholesterol. But that's really a reaction to uh, toxins and other damaging uh, components within the blood circulating throughout the system. Uh, and yeah, uh, to your point, um, you'll end up having some uh, very negative reactions. 
during the day, during the night. Um, and that's what we refer to as metabolic syndrome. All of those uh, different parameters, um, high blood pressure, high, high cholesterol, cardiovascular issues, um, to some degree, uh, cognitive decline because you're a lot of those things are crossing the blood brain barrier. If you were, yeah, what's that? Diabetes type two. Oh, type two diabetes without a doubt. Absolutely. Um, you know, and this allows heavy metals to get into the system and they are also, uh, they can also cross the blood brain barrier. If your liver is not properly detoxifying, um, we're talking about negative impacts on, uh, the, uh, endocrine system. So we're talking about a whole cascade of hormones. Um, you know, at night, your liver is most active. That is also when the tissues within your brain, um, uh, to some degree, um, reduce in size so that the uh, cerebral spinal fluid can pick up the toxins that drop uh, down uh, and into your lymphatic and uh, liver system. So if all of those systems are not working properly, obviously you're going to get a toxic buildup within your um, your cerebral spinal fluid and your brain, and that's going to drastically reduce your ability to focus, uh, handle stress, and so forth. So all of these uh, signs that we're talking about are, uh, you know, can be avoided with uh, the proper prophylactics that we're talking about, eating right, supplementing, and just being aware of these red flags. All right. So now that we have outlined it, the person that's hearing us the first time says, oh, my God, I'm already there. Right. So, okay, we have get, painted the picture. Yes, you need to change your lifestyle. The, if you continue doing what you've done up to now, you're going to con continue in the trajectory that's going to end up with a liver blowout, which is going to end your life prematurely. If you change your lifestyle, you're going to start yeah. improving. And the first thing you need to do is a, a cleanse, right? A cure. Yeah. Or I don't know if the cure is a bad word for it. A process by which you reduce the load, which is where you, with your hepatobem, and your red palm and a few other things, right? Like you, you need to put these things together to uh, to reduce the bloat. Like you need to yeah. cleanse it. Yeah, let's, and let's have at it. And certainly, we have regimens for that. So uh, again, you know, there is no uh, magic pill. However, uh, when an individual comes in and sees the physicians that have partnered with us. Typically, what they'll do is they'll put them on hepatobin, candida complex, and serapeptase. And the hepatobin uh, is half of the ingredients are dedicated to leaky gut repair, and the other half are obviously dedicated to um, spurring the phase two conjugation phase, that detox phase within the liver. So we're cleaning the liver at the same time. We're trying to um, you know, put the castle wall uh, back together. Uh, the candida complex is really important with that because it obviously goes after uh, candida, uh, and it has uh, parasitic, anti-parasitic um, components in there as well. So uh, it drastically reduces a lot of those deleterious uh, organisms. The serapeptase is important because it goes after the biofilm. And the biofilm accumulates over time. And that's sort of an amalgam of mucus and metals and candida and other stuff. And when they combine, they oftentimes make uh, ionic bonds, strongest bonds in chemistry, and need a cleaving agent in order to break them. Biofilm loves to sit in between J channels, which are those clefts in between epithelial cells, and that's going to prop that wall open, and that's going to allow things to flow in. So when we put someone on a regimen like this, um, they get better rather quickly. Their cholesterol comes down, the liver enzyme counts come down, um, their IBS uh, has a tendency to decline. Um, but again, people are eating a little bit cleaner. Uh, you know, we're drinking more water. We're talking about superfoods. We're talking about bentonite clay. We're talking about these uh, cleaning agents. Um, we're talking about avoiding the um, rancid oils, uh, making sure that an individual is on a ketogenic diet, which simply means burning fat as opposed to sugar and carbohydrates. Those are the necessary changes that folks need to be making on a regular basis. If you're taking a B vitamin, uh, and it includes B12, make sure it's methylated because you may be a carrier for the MTHFR gene mutation, and that's going to negatively uh, impact these outcomes as well. Um, always make sure that you are taking a magnesium supplement. Uh, there's 10 or 11 different forms of that out there. We talked about magnesium glycinate being the best one. Uh, some of them can create um, you know, diarrhea, 
and others can have positive impacts on neurochemistry. So you need to know which one to use and when. So those Interestingly, are we have actually solved the magnesium problem by going transdermal. That's when you, perfect. When you bypass the um, oral uh, channels, we have been uh, recommending magnesium chloride, which we have actually energetically modified. Uh, there's just another whole conversation about dealing with water and water structuring and, and bonds and stuff. But anyway, this magnesium chloride, when you soak your feet in it or you throw it in the bathtub, your body absorbs it through this transdermal mechanism straight into the lymph, bypassing the gut, and you can take very large dose very quickly. See, that's something that I need to get into too. So uh, I also spray magnesium uh, on my body for the transdermal effect, um, but I should take a look at what you're doing too. That's That sounds really good. Right. Well, so <laughs> Scott, do you want to keep going longer or should we try and close this for now? Well, I was thinking that maybe, Brendan, what you could do is talk a little, I know you've sort of mentioned them, but if you could talk specifically about uh, some of the different uh, products that you've got on your site. Perfect. So um, Hepatabin is sort of our flagship product. That was one of the first products that we came out with uh, that has eight ingredients in it, four of which dedicated, as I said before, for detoxifying the liver and four of which dedicated to GI tract um, repair. Um, and they work synergistically with each other, enhancing uh, the effects of one another. That's uh, probably the first step that I would tell people to uh, incorporate into their um, supplement uh, regimen. Candida Complex uh, has all of the um, important things in there, the oregano, the caprylic acid, it also has other things, uh, other ingredients that are uh, anti um, uh, uh, antibacterial, anti-pathogenic. Uh, uh, has your cell cellulase and your protease in there to break down cell walls and so forth and has a little bit of probiotics in the back end because when you end up clearing the fields, uh, there are always something opportunistic that wants to move in. So you got to, you know, uh, make sure that you put something in there. Um, the serapeptase is uh, enteric coated, uh, very important for removing biofilm as we uh, had discussed earlier. Also, one in 10 women have endometriosis. It's a good application for that. Uh, when you combine it with liver health, it is going after fibrous tissue, scar tissue within the liver, and it's breaking down those things. So when you end up removing toxins within the liver and you end up removing fibrous scar tissue, you are giving the liver some available real estate in order to um, renew uh, and reverse a lot of the hepatic cell damage. Um, the other things that we have in there are red palm oil. I'm a big proponent of uh, medium chain triglycerides. Uh, when we take a look at vitamin E, because essentially it's a uh, glorified vitamin E, um, there are eight components, half of which are tocotrienols, half of which are tocopherols. It's the tocotrienols um, we're starting to find out in the last uh, 10, five years that are doing really the heavy lifting. And when we take a look at where the tocotrienols are in highest concentration, it's the red palm fruit. Uh, what we've done is taken that and concentrated that to about 152X um, toxic free. Uh, and folks can use that for liver health, cardiovascular and brain health. And it's um, a really good product to throw in there along with the pad event. Um, and then we have a sugar balance product for individuals who are on short-term, long-term insulin. And it's uh, been very useful for physicians to sort of wean their uh, patients off of um, the insulin. Um, and then we also have um, the Zen products, which uh, are the calming and um, sleep products. And oftentimes what we were doing was we would find these individuals with liver problems and the gut problems. They always had adrenal fatigue for the obvious reasons that we talked about before. And the entire process of trying to rehabilitate folks and detoxify their system and get them back to good health always had to include an adrenal fatigue product. Um, typically, we were recommending Gaia, which is a great source. Uh, but then we ended up just making these products, which are a little less expensive than Gaia. Uh, and of course, are completely organic and very clean, no magnesium stearate or any of those other things that are somewhat controversial in our industry. So that's sort of the regimen. Um, and if people have complications, uh, you know, we have articles um, that go into more detail about what physicians are using in addition to these things and what diets to use and so forth. Good. Interestingly, we have had products that parallel this loosely. 
We have promoted uh, serapeptase, we have that, and we have promoted a liver product that we have developed ourselves, and we have a, even a herbal supplement called Cortisol Ease that helps to uh, discombobulate the excess cortisol in the body. Excellent. And, and so on, so, which is wonderful. You know, like our lives have paralleled in many ways, but it's nice to hear how well you've put this together. Well, yeah, and likewise, I think a lot of people, it's important for folks to listen to, uh, you know, formulators like yourself and me. And, you know, we put these things together, sort of understanding the pathology. Uh, can't get enough of us as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> so <laughs> I have a question for you. Um, some people promote the liver gallbladder flush. The... Uh, uh, drink some magnesium to cleanse and then hit yourself with a large whack of olive oil with some lemon juice to cause the um, essentially a massive evacuation of the gallbladder. Yes. Yes. What's, what's your thought about that? I'm a big proponent of that. I would also throw in um, some garlic in there for the, you know, sort of the antiseptic uh, antibacterial effects on that too. But I'm a huge proponent of that. Um, you know, before, uh, I was recommending, you know, people end up, uh, incorporating a beet salad, uh, first thing in the morning with the olive oil and the lemon juice and the garlic. Uh, you might want to make sure you don't have any meetings that day, obviously, uh, because it's not a pleasant, uh, um, way to, uh, it's, it's got a kind of a, an unhealthy smell on your mouth, but, um, that's a really good way of clearing everything out. Absolutely. Uh, it's right. got good fiber in there and so forth. Yeah. Yeah. The uh, apple beet carrot juice with garlic on top. Yeah, absolutely. Um, people start throwing mint and, uh, and celery juice in there too is, uh, is a very good idea. Yeah. Uh -huh. Those are really good cleanses. Right. Yeah. We have that described in detail on our website. Some people uh, pre process with malic acid or some other malates to soften the, um, the gallstones. Yeah, that's excellent. Yeah. And obviously, if um, all of these processes are being inhibited and phase two is sort of at a standstill, there's going to be a lot less bile, um, but you're still going to get a lot of the salts and the salts end up accumulating and creating stones. So to your point, you know, a lot of times we run into uh, people who have the liver issue originally, well, originally really the, the gut issue, then the liver issue. And they don't really address either of those. And then a physician gets them and says, you've got so many problems with your gallbladder, we have to remove it. And so that really complicates um, a lot of these uh, cleanses and regimens, but it can still be done. Um, so you need to, uh, again, take a close look at uh, the supplementation and, um, and these things that we're talking about, for sure. Awesome. So to sum up, number one, stop the flow of poisons into your body. Number two, heal your gut, because that is the hallway through which everything goes into the liver room, where you need to repair the damage you've already done. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, take care of yourself. Uh, we haven't talked about exercise. Of course, exercise is a, is a major component of this stuff, too. Um, but yeah, food is thy medicine. Medicine is thy food. Um, start taking a look at ingredients. If anything has uh, more than uh, 12 letters in it, avoid it. <laughs> you know, you have to become a, a proven ingredient reader and avoid GMOs. Go on an organic diet. Um, grow the stuff in your backyard if you have to. Uh, mm -hmm. And we didn't talk about water. You know, avoid fluoride and, and a lot of the other uh, oh, things. Yeah, fluoride for sure. Yeah, if they're throwing it in water to remove the bacteria count in water, and once you drink it, it's going to do the same thing to you, obviously. Yeah. You know what's interesting? You just reviewed the uh, ebook that uh, Scott and I put out. In it, we have these four causes of illness, which is malnutrition, toxicity, stagnation, and trauma. Yeah. Uh, the toxicity, of course, is the load of stuff you have that you had already absorbed and shouldn't have. Malnutrition is the lack of good things that you should have and aren't getting. Stagnation is the lack of movement, the lack of exercise, and the trauma is we didn't even discuss it here, but the liver, well, you mentioned it, liver is the organ of uh, the emotion of anger and repressed anger is depression. And uh, if this is not being properly processed through the emotional body, you can cause 
energetic damage so that the energy, the controls of this process will be impaired in subtle ways that could lead to complication. Boy, this, you know, the, we could talk about this for another hour, but yeah, this ends up getting into sort of the spiritual component, the metaphysical component of this. Uh, yeah, as we talked about the emotional seat of the soul, all that. I can't tell you how many times I have conversations with folks who have liver issues and either they've had a, a death in the family recently, they've lost a job, um, they have somebody in their family who's on drugs. There is some emotional component that is making everything much worse and driving certain addictions that could be a food addiction um, and creating depression and so forth. And all of these things are sort of bottled up in the same problem. So yeah, excellent that you brought that up. And then <laughs> I keep thinking of the other things. There's the famous Epstein bar, right? You oh, get the mononucleosis and blow the whole house of cards uh, Right. Yeah. And that's usually, um, I don't know what your experience is, but that's usually the, that's uh, sort of the late comer to the party. So when all of the other systems are sort of broken down, that's the most opportunistic. And when it moves in, you know, you're in bad shape. Uh, the other component that we oftentimes see, well, I was up in Connecticut for a period of time. So, uh, it was Lyme disease. Yes. Uh, yeah. And that really complicates uh, just about everything that we're talking about. That in and of itself can create uh, leaky gut. Um, it uh, bypasses the blood brain barrier and causes all kinds of uh, issues with depression and fatigue. And getting rid of it is a problem. And if you incorporate a good enzyme like serapeptase and it's in the background or if it's sitting in biofilm, you need to be really careful with that stuff because it will create a, uh, a blowout. So um, important for us to note. We really appreciate, Brennan, you taking uh, this time out of your busy day to share all this information with us. If somebody wanted to know more about the products, I have two questions. One is, where can they go? And two is, can we give them a deal? Yeah, absolutely. And thank you very much for having me on. It was, it's really been a pleasure. So they can visit uh, livermedic.com uh, and they can go to our Facebook page. Uh, we have an 800 number. They can give a call and they can get a free consultation if that's what they're uh, interested in. Um, and we have a discount. Um, so if uh, folks uh, listen to this uh, and they want to get the discount on the Liver Medic products, they can visit our page, uh, put in the discount code uh, LE Liver. Uh, so that's uh, an easy way to get a little uh, bonus for uh, participating in this as well. Uh, and I, I think I've covered my bases there. I think that's it. You can always shoot me an email. I'm always very responsive. Wonderful. Thank you very much for joining us, Brendan. And Martin, if somebody wanted to, uh, to know more about some things that they should be doing for their health, how can they get a hold of you? We are in yeah. life. Go on, go on, Brendan. I'm, no, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt. Go ahead. All right. In closing, we are at Life Enthusiast, life-enthusiast.com. Uh, our phone number is 866-543-3388. And you can uh, get hold of us and we can put you back in touch with livermedic.com. Wonderful. Thanks for joining us, everybody. Really appreciate you. This has been the Life Enthusiast online radio and TV network, restoring vitality to you and the planet. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.